or we could, we're not used to doing this, not as used to data taxi data. <laughs> so we're not even sure which is the right thing. Or walk down there. No, no, do it up there. We're going to do it up there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Audience participation is the maximum. <laughs> sympathy for the question, questioner. Not more sympathy for the person who was, if David were here, you'd say his victim. Because <laughs> it, it was sometimes pretty tough being questioned by David. You've got the impression he was very, very, very nice until he asked a sort of horrible question and was quite rude to people in the audience. And, and, and hopefully we're not I'm going well, to be very, none of those very things. On that. Um, very we're particularly thrilled to have somebody who's, some of you may know, Lucy Tang, David's widow, who's not been here often in the past year, but she's, if you give us one of your lovely smiles. Thank you, Lucy. And um, sorry if I don't say, if I say you know, teasing things about your late yeah, husband. Yeah. But to carry, to carry on. Um, well, our guest today is uh, Mr. Stacey. Um, I didn't know him well, but I've got to know him better for the last 30 minutes. I was a bit, someone called Sir Nicholas Bates, quite, um, you're wondering how formal you're going to be. And then he saw I wasn't wearing a tie, and I said that people would be disappointed he wasn't wearing a Hermes tie. It then turns out he wasn't wearing a Hermes tie, he was wearing a Ferragamo tie, which is also a smarter deal. Um, and um, was used to that. Um, and he's not usually a sort of person who appears in front of audiences, or so he tells me. Um, but he is a person who cha chairs rather sort of terrifyingly important bodies. So I think he's probably more used to this than he will admit. Um, and when I expressed these concerns to him just a few moments ago, he said, oh, don't worry, it's about, a, it's about enjoying ourselves and laughing. 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 Mm. So, help us to have 58 minutes of laughing and me, and particularly you, to ask irreverent things which you didn't think you dared ask to such a very smart, and very well connected person. Because um, he is a, a really, in the posh states, pretty posh. And I asked him whether he'd mind me starting a conversation about you know, his poshness. And he said, not at all. I'm a top. And we laughed. So we got onto a very good start. He's still laughing. But, um, We've had one person who isn't as posh, but came here also very scared about what was going to happen. Um, a lovely man called Jacob Rothschild. Lucy was, you were probably here, Jacob. We had no means of communicating with the outside world, really, when we started up. And um, so we used WeChat. Is it called WeChat or YouChat? Anyway, it was some... WeChat. So WeChat. WeChat. From China. From China. And we had an audience of about 300 Chinese students, absolutely fascinated to meet a posh Brit, especially with a name like Rothschild. Opportunity to joke about Stacey versus Rothschild, we'll avoid it. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll avoid that one. Yes. We'll avoid it. But, but Jake was mobbed, and it was very charming, but um, very, very difficult to have a conversation at all. So we'll do better than better than that. Um, David, by the way, how many people are here for the first time? Anybody? Oh, there we go. How lovely. I thought everybody who, who had, could ever have been had been. So you're, you're especially welcome. And welcome to those who, for some strange reason, have come back. Um, that's also particularly uh, fantastic. Um, David, um, who, well, there were two of us, really, myself and um, and 90 percent him and 10 percent me um, started this show to try to have a discussion between the Chinese people in London in the world, British people in London and Britain, and to talk and exchange views about our cultures and ambitions and thoughts and ways of approaching life. 
and um, it's gone very well and will continue to go very well. But David was a mercurial, fantastic character who you would have thought was posh, but he wasn't posh at all. He was a, you know, a smart, bright lad, very bright lad from Hong Kong. And he was sent by his parents to school near Cambridge. And he became British. And believe it or not, he became posh. Relative. But all things are relative, are they not? And next door to me, Sir Nicholas Bacon, he is properly posh. He has a wonderful name. I put it out in Wikipedia, so you might like want to correct it. <coughs> Sir Nicholas Hickman Ponsonby Bacon. Ponsonby. Pon I pronounced it wrong. He's a landowner in Norfolk for some reason, which I'm hoping he might explain to us. It was either good luck or brilliance or born in the right place. He's a businessman. He's a barrister. I, 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 I got it out of Wikipedia. He was a beekeeper. Um, it turns out you're not a beekeeper. I was the president of the Norfolk Beekeepers Association, and they are the most extraordinarily acerbic bunch. They were <laughs> bizarre. The AGM that I had to chair every year, there was more fighting than you can possibly imagine. And it was probably the most difficult AGM, even more difficult than the Royal Horticultural Society's AGMs to chair, because I don't know, they'd probably been stung too much or something, <laughs> but they just were just impossible. But, and and I, when, I, when I, I started to do various jobs in, in London and around the UK, um, the bees always used to swarm at the wrong moment. I was always away at Chelsea or Chelsea Flower Show or whatever it was, and they'd always swarm, and that would be the end of that. So I'd get back to an empty hive, and I thought, well, this is ridiculous. I can't possibly carry on being, A, the president of the Norfolk Beekeepers, or B, be a beekeeper myself. So I'm leaving that for, for retirement. <laughs> so you're not a beekeeper? No. No. Supporter of beekeepers. Anyway, there's a certain amount of this about. Um, he is the Lord Warden of Stanley's, which is, must be one of the most difficult jobs, to, well, job titles to retain in your head. But it means that he's the chairman of the group of people, wise people, who manage the Prince of Wales's Duchy of Cornwall's estate. You might want to talk to him about that at the moment. He's got four sons, who I haven't met, and he's got a fabulous wife, who isn't here this evening, uh, called Susie Bacon, who's an artist. And I thought I would start off by asking him the question, which I have asked permission to ask him, are you posh? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I just think that, that you've got to be upfront about these things. You can't just hide under your, your uh, under a, uh, stick your head beneath the parapet. You've got to uh, admit the fact that one's a top, one's posh, and one went to Eton and, and did all those sort of things. And, and the fact is that I had no option but to do it. I, it wasn't as if I chose to go to Eton, but I'm delighted that I did go to Eton because as my father said, the Etonians, and there's one or two here I can see, the Etonians are the best and the worst of people. Um, and it is one of those extraordinary things that the Royal Horticultural Society, okay, well, you might say, well, it is a pretty posh, elitist organization in the gardening world. We're trying desperately to make it less so. But all the last um, presidents for the last 65 years have been Old Etonians. And the only exception to that was my predecessor, who was Elizabeth Banks, who, was, who wasn't allowed to go to Eton anyhow. So it is the most extraordinary thing. Why do Old Etonians get involved with all these extraordinary charities? Possibly it is because we are imbued with that sort of social conscience at school. Um, but other than that, I can't think why. We, we all seem to percolate into these, into these charitable jobs that we do. But it's great fun. And being a TOF, well, we, we're an endangered species, which is encouraging. Um, we're a minority group, which most minority groups, I'm sure you would agree, if, if 
and people were as rude to other minority groups as they're as rude about cops, we would actually be able to take them to court. But somehow, we're not allowed to do that, and they don't seem to, they don't seem to care. So we are basically um, sitting there, able to take as much flat as, we, as they possibly want to throw at us. And we don't mind in mind, because we accept the fact that we're toffs. Um, we were born into toffery, and there's nothing we can do about it. And how was you born? I mean, how, how did you bump into toffery and b becoming a landowner? Well, we, you, you we, 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 um, we rose up the sort of social greasy pole of, in, the, in the reign of Henry VIII. And Henry VIII gave, as you know, the dissolution of the monasteries, one of the great, um, biggest social upheavals since 1066. And Henry VIII happened to give my forebear, Nicholas Bacon, the same name, um, who was in the right place at the right time, many of the estates that used to be owned by the monastic lands. And so I think I, I can perfectly well say that um, that the Bacons are rather like the, the Russian plutocrats of today, the oligarchs of today, because we receive state assets for nothing. And okay, it was 500 years ago, but then it's exactly the same as, as what, is, what happened in, in Russia under Putin. So we are a pretty um, um, disagreeable bunch, really, those people who received all, this, all these lands and estates for, for, for nothing. But it's been going on forever. And then um, in, on the 27th of May, 1611, um, one of my forebears, another Nicholas Baker, was made the first baronet. Um, and this was because James I wanted some money to send uh, troops to Ulster. And you either wrote out a check for 1,200 quid, um, or you commanded a troop to fight the Ulstermen. Now, most people wrote out a check because they didn't want to go to Ulster. But that's, in my book, the same as cash for honours. So these things just are there. They, they exist, and they've happened before. So nothing very much is, is new in the world, um, because that happened 400 years ago. And you've lost your seat in the House of Lords, so you're no longer a parliamentarian, or are no, you? No, I never was. You never were? No, I never, we, never, we never were peers. Oh, no, you never no, were no, no, peers. No, 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 you're no, cynical. No. Yeah, my, my, right. my, my father but turned out of Was a, a member of parliament? No. no. He, he, he turned out of a, a, a peerage on the basis that he, he said there were 750 peers. Why do I want to be a peer? When I could, I could still be the Premier Baronet of England, and, it, and that is what I am. You can, the pre, you are, yeah. the Premier Baronet of England. Premier can Baronet you, of England. Does everybody know what that means? No. no. <coughs> would, would, would you like to know? I, I, I'd love to know. Well, I mean, we, what's the difference we, we, between we a paid name? Our, we paid our twelve hundred quid, and we just have our name just happened to begin with B A, I suppose. And so we were the first person that James I made a baronet. And James I wanted to create a new social order between a baron and a knight. And so he created a baronet. Um, and we were the first people to, to be anointed as, as a baronet, having paid our 1,200 pounds. So okay. your dad was he Sir was Edmund. Edmund Beckham. Yeah. And your son, eldest son? Was Hickman. Sir. No. Not yet. No, 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 no,
dreadful, um, charming. Um, and I've still got best friends today who I met at, who I met at Eton. So it is an extraordinary place. Um, and what it achieves is, is bizarre. It's, it's just a fantastic experience. And I don't regret at all being there. I think it's a, it's a matter of celebration. One should actually stand up and say, I was at Eton. It's a hell of a good place to be. Has it ever been suggested it should be a co-ed school, or it just wouldn't work? I don't know. I, I'm sure all these things work, don't they, to some degree. Um, but I'm not, I'm not sure it, it, it might not. But well, it wouldn't have been. Well, it certainly wasn't when I was. So is it a healthy thing, in your view? Well, it clearly is a healthy thing, in your view. Is it a healthy, not a healthy thing, anybody else's view? No, that, I disagree. I think boys' schools and girls' schools are good. You, you do? Yeah, I do. But yeah. the state, on the whole, but most people don't go to such schools. So I'm just trying to get to the, to the question is, is this not creating a sort of uh, elite group who, because they network together and know people who are in positions of power, etc. Well, I, I, there was a, there yeah. was a movement not so long ago that public schools should you know, have their tax status changed and, if possible, got rid of. And uh, that actually... I don't hear anyone proposing that now. It's just the status quo seems to be accepted, so good or bad. Well, it, exactly. I, I, I would sort of leave it at that. It's sort of outside my, my pay grade really to talk about that sort of thing because I don't, I don't really understand it. But, but in terms of network, okay, the network is, is a remarkable network. But then every social order has, has a network. I, I used to have a chief executive in, in a lift business, which I used to, which I used, to, which I started. And he was a miner's son up, up in um, Nottinghamshire. And he said, the, you think you tops have a very, have a very uh, remarkable network, but the miners have far, far greater and closer network than you could ever have. So there are networks wherever you are in, in society. And I think singling out Eton or Harrow or, or whatever is, is uh, just it's just one of the very many... I think I'm going to have. tell people, which I tried out and knew before, and we thought, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, which was, um, I used to run an organisation called the Prince's Trust, and at the same time, two charitable trusts, which had been established for King George's Jubilee in 1935, and uh, the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 1977. And the, the public, especially in 1935, huge numbers of the public had been given very generously there, was, there were tens of millions of pounds more under management um, by the group of trustees. And um, I arrived fairly unfamiliar with how this sort of stuff works. I, I've been a bureaucrat, used to fill you know, follow rules and that sort of thing. And, um, but my boss said, I, I think we should kind of rationalize this. And rather than having all these different bodies, we might sort of modernize it and bring in a bit of new blood. So um, I was deputed to draft the letter which he would then send to the existing trustees um, uh, asking them whether they would consider any sort of society and being very polite of standing down. And um, the trustees were chair. In fact, they didn't really have a chair. They had um, a lovely man called, very tall, called John Berry. I think John Berry probably went, so he did, to that school. Uh, he was never so crude as calling him the chairman, but he had a bank, Bearing Bank, and they managed the money, for which they were paid a substantial fee, and that was all fine, and they did a good job. But um, before he wrote to the chair, um, he wrote to a lovely man called Lord Wardington, Bick Wardington, suggesting that now it comes at the time to retire and um, bring in some new blood. So he wrote a nice letter, and Lord Warrington replied, I'm most embarrassed that you should have to write to me in this way, because of course I should have retired long ago. It is just that until Johnny's sad demise, Johnny being Johnny Spencer, Lady Diana's father, all the trustees came from the same house at Eton. It does show that you've had a certain penetration in such places, and uh, still do. And it's a marvellous school. And William and Harry went there, uh, and 
have, have shone as a result, and the whole business of you know public service, which is the ethos of the place, um, is a very important part of British public life, which could do with, in my view, a little bit of dilution in the way that we did with the Prince's Trust, and which had, had to happen in the previous generation. But then you became a barrister. Well, my, my former was, was um, in effect, Lord Chief Justice in, in England in, in around 1530. So it was right that I, I, I went to the bar. So I, I, I went to the bar, you, 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 you eat your dinners. Um, once you've eaten your dinners and passed your exams, you become a barrister at law, or an utter barrister at law. And to be honest, my father was not very well at the time, so, so he asked me to come home and, and, and manage, manage the, the estate. So I didn't really, I didn't practice at all. But the extraordinary thing about the, the, um, the eating your dinners is that you had, to, you had to go into the great hall and you sat down and you had a canter of claret between, between four and a, and a, and a um, decanter of port between six. So what you used to do is you used to try to find all your friends who were Muslims or, 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 or didn't drink and said made a beeline for this and so you could have a rather, rather good dinner. Um, while they were drinking water. So it was, it was, it was an extraordinary experience. So it still happens today. And one you thing, have it, to it, it didn't dinner. involve the study of a tremendous amount of law. No, you didn't. You had to, you had to pass your exams. But oh, the more important yes. thing was to actually, was to actually um, eat your dinners. That was, that was much more important. And on one occasion, um, I remember it was a Sunday night and there were very few people, so I was asked to the top table where there was a picture of my, my forebear, Nicholas Baker, over it. And um, I was sat next door to a wonderful judge, Lord Elwyn Jones. And it was just during a time when, when there was a lot of paper, the media were talking about how out of touch the judges were. And he's, he came up with this wonderful expression. He said, um, I suppose they think we reproduce like parthenogenesis. Well, I had to go and look it up, you know, because I thought it was just quite bizarre. And Gray's Inn, which was the inn of court where I went, um, when they toast the, the royal toast, the Queen, they don't stand up. And they don't stand up because my forebear used to ask Queen Elizabeth to dinner on, on many occasions there. And so she used to get fed up with everybody standing up and, and, and toasting, toasting the Queen. So as a result, rather like the Navy, um, at the inns of court, they don't stand up when they, when they toast the royal toast. So it's a, it's a funny There's not many places where someone could, you could hear someone say, my ancestors used to get, uh, raise the glass to Elizabeth I. Well, not only that, she, she used to go and stay with it. It's the whole retinue. The whole retinue, a very expensive well, he, thing. He, one of the things he did was to build Gorhambury. Gorhambury uh, was just outside London. And he built Gorhambury in about 1550 um, for about 5,500 pounds. And then the Queen used to come and stay uh, for two weeks with her entire retinue. And that used to cost about £2,000. So you can imagine why a lot, of, a lot of the toffs of the day went bust entertaining the Queen. Because building a, a house um, for twice as much as it cost two weeks' worth of, of entertainment was, was quite extraordinary. And he, she, she came to him and... Uh, and said on one occasion, she said, um, Sir Nicholas, you've got what a little house you have gotten yourself. And rather, rather unctuously, I think, he said, um, but it is you that have made, too, made me too big for my house. So, but anyhow, he, he, he died in 1570, um, having, he lived at the York House in, in London, which now has been demolished. Um, and he, he died of a, of a chill that he caused by an open window. <coughs> It's rather wonderful where you were first 1550 as if it was yesterday. You, you live it. It is. It is. So you, you didn't practice the law. No. You went home to your estate. Yeah. As you said, Norfolk is quite close to London. It takes an awful long time to get there, which is the most wonderful thing. You don't have much, too many dual carriageways. No, we don't. Very good. No. But it's on the way to nowhere, and it's a marvellous place to live. And I've lived there all my life, so I, I, it is just. Um, the place that one was brought up, and therefore the place that you are passionate about. And you garden? 
Well, it would be pretty embarrassing if, if um, as president of the Royal, Royal Horticultural Society, I didn't garden. Yes, but which comes with, which comes first, presumably? Uh, the gardening. My, the gardening mother, my mother was a sort of very keen, mad amateur gardener. She has things, you know, plants named after her. She was a, one of, I suppose, the first galanthophiles, i.e. lovers of snowdrops. And there's a snowdrop named after her. Um, there's a fuchsia named after her, which I should never understand why, because she hated fuchsia. And there was a um, there's an agapanthus named after her. But so she she was a passionate gardener, and I think that's it gets into your blood. So you just carry on, and, and she would be appalled if she if she knew that I became president of the, of the RHS because she would have just said, "But you know nothing," which is absolutely true. I have to say. You don't have to know anything. You chair, the, you chair the meetings brilliantly. Well, that's right. You, you and you raise you, money. You, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what you yeah, exactly. Have to do. You have to do that, but you can't. Got long gone the days when you had professors and, and um, botanists who were who were presidents of the RHS. They, they don't do, they don't do that anymore. Um, is the RHS fantastically posh? Is it, I mean, the National Trust, you might think, is fantastically posh, but it's the, the organisation with the biggest membership in Britain. It is. Um, and I, uh, RHS, I think, is sort I of. I think the RHS region. has a reputation of being very posh, um, but actually, we're trying to dispel that notion that that it is posh. Because we're we're going we're going into into inner cities, we're doing a lot of outreach, yeah. a lot of education, really important, um, which is the whole point of it being. Because we can look after gardens and put on shows, but actually, what makes it what makes it worthwhile is the is your education, the community work, and, and all that side of it. And we have now um, a partnership with the NHS, mental health side, to just to show that gardening is incredibly good for your mental health. So that's really fundamental. Yeah. Now, if we're going to have the room to take part in this conversation, there's, there's nothing, I mean, as we've seen, we've talked about toffs, we've talked about posh, we've talked about landowners, we've talked about Elizabeth I. There's nothing off the agenda. Would anyone like to ask Nicholas, please? Can, can is this, are, you, are you admitting to come from Eton or are you no, this? No, I'm not. Yeah, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm from New Zealand. I'm from New Zealand. Zealand. Oh, right. I'd, like, I'd like to talk about red salt because when I came here uh, when David was still alive, he told me off for wearing pink socks. So I think tonight he would have told you off for wearing red socks. So that's a David Tang uh, memory. Well, the reason I, read, I, 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 I wear red socks because there was a terrible moment when I went to an Indian wedding in Regent's Park, and we had to take our shoes and socks, shoes off. And of course, um, I had odd socks and rather holy socks. And I thought, well, the only way to do this is to only have one colour. So I chose red socks as as the colour. So all my socks are red. Well, David told me off the pink socks. They were pink, I can understand that. But red is different. So, you, all your socks are red? All my you have socks. You have no socks other than red socks? No. no. This is a very practical thing because you wouldn't. Uh, well, you can't have odd socks. You can't have odd socks. <laughs> so, this is the China Exchange of you on socks. Thank you very much. Sorry. It's just ridiculous. I remember it from days. Uh, yes, and now it's clearly you didn't go to Eton, I can hear that. Um, who does go to Eton in this room? Someone else is. No, you are the only. Uh, no, 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 I'm no. not. I know, there's someone sitting there, un yeah. unable, uh, very unlike, unlike them, to, to keep their light on the bush. Who's happened to wear any ties? Who's happened to wear any ties? Yes, please. Well, now, don't, don't now let's have silence. We've got this fascinating man here, and you're not from Italy. Please. You're not from Italy, you're not from Italy. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't get to Italy. So. Um, no, but I understand you uh, earlier earlier on in your life, a page to, to Queen Elizabeth II. So how was that experience? And uh, the real question is, did you have a trip in front of her? <laughs> well, that, that was the most incredible experience, because one was... Did everyone get the question? You, like, oh, well, I, I, I was... I was, a, a, I was a, a page of honor to the Queen, to the, to the current Queen. And um, that meant that you carried her train at high days and holidays, like the opening of Parliament, um, the garter service, the order of the bath service. And so you, you, you became part of that whole um, extraordinary experience. 
And the opening of Parliament was absolutely fascinating when I was there because, um, A, it's the only time I've ever been cartoonized, as it were, in, in, in a newspaper because it was the evening standard and it was the days of um, Harold Wilson where taxation was running at sort of 98%. And um, there was a cartoon in the, in the, in the press which, which had a picture of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh and then, uh, then some gawky looking four gawky-looking pages behind. And the caption was, in view of the measures put forward by my government, my husband and I have decided to emigrate, which I thought was, was great. Um, and the other point about that particular opening of Parliament was that um, Lord, Lord Montgomery was, was carried the sword of state. And he was quite a small man. And the sword of state was a, is a very large and very heavy thing. And at one stage, the, the sword of state started to, to, to wobble and then to sway. And Lord Montgomery started to sway with it. So Lord Shackleton, who, was, who had the cap of maintenance, which was another one of these extraordinary items, he had to stop it swaying and, and, and take it from uh, Montgomery because otherwise the whole thing would have come crashing down with him. So being, being a page was, was extraordinary because you met all these um, historic figures that one now reads about as, as heroes or whatever it was. Those with the English as a second language may be wondering what a page is or say, because you were familiar with a page in a book. Yes. This is a can we, get, can we give a bit of definition about page? Well, a page is someone who, 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 who basically is um, a, a, a young valet, I suppose, um, someone who, who just takes the Queen's train. And the important thing is that the, all the pages of the Queen have to be smaller than her. So when I was 14, I was smaller than the Queen, and then I shot up. <laughs> I'm also just trying to help you with the language here, because this word valet is probably yeah. unfamiliar to you, and it's not a, a, a sort of thing through which a river runs, but it's a person who looks after your clothes, posh people's clothes. Yes, it's posh yes. people's clothes, but yes, it's not... Irons your tie, that kind of thing. Oh, no. Please. But I think it's I pronounced think you made it valid. A valid. <laughs> oh, but, oh, valid. Oh, sorry. But, but I, yeah, you're, quite, you're quite right. Being Could you help us? <laughs> language is important. The Chinese language is particularly important. But it's one of the most common mistakes that people make, which is to call it valet, which, of course, comes from valet parking in America. Not from valet. Uh, Quite different. I thought someone. I thought you would pick me up on that, David. Yes. I, you know, I, Is there an Italian in the back of the room? Well, it's we funny that. We do it's it funny today. that. Yes, there's a bit of sort of <laughs> mobbing up going on. Certainly. Please. Thank you very much, Is the next generation going to be as responsible as the previous generation? in terms of your sons and their children? Responsible uh, for what? In terms of, you know, kind of looking after, because obviously the new generation have their own ideas, and probably uh, uh, their children will obey them less than you obeyed your father. I, I just think that, 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 to use a very old word, custodianship, you are custodian of what you are, you have inherited. It's not as if you've actually made money in order to build up what, what one's got. So one is a custodian, you, 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 you've earned it through birth, nothing more. And so it's up to us to make sure that we look forward for 50 years, 100 years, to make sure that it, it's um, still intact in, in 100 years' time. Now my son, um, he, he has a very different career at the moment, but, but when I become Gaga or, or uh, die. I, I hope he comes back home and, and looks after whatever there is um, with the same sort of long-term interest that I have done um, and my father did. We've all had our problems. You know, did, my father lived through difficult times. He, he was an Edwardian, my father, really. And I was brought up by someone who I used to go and visit 
with a tie on, you did. aged age five. And did you call Every, him sir? Almost. 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 Yes. I used to visit him in the evening uh, for a quarter of an hour, and I was, that's all I was allowed to spend with him. And then I used to be taken back upstairs again to the nursery, where one had, um, where one was given food and all that sort of thing. And my nanny being 75 when I was born, she couldn't get downstairs. So I, I had to go back upstairs. So, and then the butler would arrive with, with, um, with all the food. All that sort of, it, it's, talking about it sounds like a completely bygone age because well, that sort of thing doesn't happen. It is a bygone age, probably, isn't it? And, and, and did you then ensure that you became a better father than him? Sorry, did I? Did you then ensure that you became a better father to than your father was? Oh, my dad was a really good father. Yeah. But he was an Edwardian father. And I, and I got on with him terribly well. When I, when I, when I turned sort of 18, I, I got on with him incredibly well. Um, and he was an extraordinary man. But he, he, should, he should have been sitting here, really, rather than me, because um, he, okay, he was a knight of the garter and, and all that sort of stuff. So he was, he was a sort of good, good chap, really, you know, in many ways. So no, he was saying, not a gardener. No, I'm not saying he's a bad chap. What I'm saying is, uh, did, did, you always, did you end up spending more time with your children than what he did with you? Oh, I think yes. I, I think I would be hounded out of here if I said no. Um, but no, very much so. Yes, I think there's a very different way of, of bringing up children today than there was then. Then, but I'm not. But the hi history will tell whether it's any better or worse in, in terms of um, the character, of the personality, and the and what people do, um, because they gave us a very strong example of what they expected. And okay, we didn't communicate at the age of two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But then, when I became sort of more normal, we communicated a lot. And this worked well? Obviously, it did in your case. Right. <laughs> well, my grand. I mean, it does seem always, pretty odd. My, my, well, it is very odd, but Let's looking back on it, but my grand. You see, my grandmother always used to say, one thing, you, you mustn't talk about yourself. So, doing this is, is a very, very different, difficult thing for me, really. Let me push you a bit on this because you just said before that you weren't used to this kind of doing things in public because that would be talking about yourself. Really? I'm asking you questions about yourself. Well, I know. And you've been five minutes with your grandfather with great formality before you were led away. Yeah, that was my father. So what, did you, what were the rules that your grandmother... Um, you mustn't talk about yourself, um, the weather or religion. When? Yeah, that was yes. just boring. That was straightforward. That was just boring. But it is still boring. But people yeah. do talk a lot about they it do. a lot, don't they? And yes. that's why I, I sort of tend not to talk about. It. But you you look back on your childhood with affection. Oh, complete affection. If I'm a very positive person, I, I think yes. one's got to be positive, and and, and uh, I think one was incredibly lucky to because I was in effect because my father was 50 years older than I was. Um, I was brought up by the. The, the chauffeur, the butler, and the gamekeeper. And I used to spend all my time with them. And they were fantastic people. But now again, the, 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 we really are at a top in this here, because this yeah. is, it's quite unusual. And it's- It's pretty it's, normal for us, us lot. Yes, um. <laughs> but it's it supported, for example, it, 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 the largest empire the world has ever seen is unsurprisingly operated rather different to the way we do now. But this, some of this stuff was at the, at the centre of it, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And, and, the, and the people that were employed brought up most of the children in the house. It wasn't, it wasn't the parents. Yeah. They did their own thing. Yeah. Sorry, there's someone... Yeah. Um, I was going to ask um, about how you manage um, the estate. Um, in terms of farming, I mean, do you, do you grow barley, sugar beet, solar panels? Uh... Oh, yeah, we, we do all that. We, we do all that sort of stuff. Um, we also used to have a herd of cows, but but they they I couldn't afford to carry on with them. So we now have a suckler herd because we have a um, a house in a in a in a in a in a, in a park. And therefore, that has been permanent pasture for forever. Um, we need to have something to graze it, so we, we graze it with Sussex cattle. And then, being Norfolk, we have um, the usual wheat, barley, uh, sugar beet, and so forth. 
Um, but we also, I'm, I'm very keen on, on the conservation side of, of the whole thing. I think what is going on at the moment in terms of the whole issue of, of Brexit and what might happen to subsidies thereafter, I think is fascinating because I think we, the, the farming has got to appreciate that we can't just go on feeding ourselves, but actually um, having quite a short-sighted view as to uh, insects and the like. Um, and so therefore we've got to really consider quite carefully how subsidies in the future are paid, whether they should be paid purely for food production or whether they should be a quid pro quo with um, insects, flora, and, and such like. So it's, 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 a, it's a really key issue at the moment. I'm a person who's very hostile to Brexit, but I have to say, listening to Michael Doe talking about stewardship of the countryside and to discover that 80% of hedgehogs has delivered, has dis dis disappeared in the past 80 years, must mean there's something about the common agriculture policy which doesn't work very well, whether it, whether it can be adapted. Well, I hate to tell you this, Tom, but actually, badgers kill Eight. hedgehogs. Yes. They are the biggest problem for hedgehogs. So I say, bring back the bears, because the bears eat the badgers who eat the hedgehog. So it's, it's like all these things. You, you, if you take out the, yeah, the, the, top, the yeah. top level of, of, of um, predator, then everything below that has a wonderful time. Yes, yeah, so you're not actually, bears probably a bit impractical, but, but badgers. Well, badgers, are, if you want to. They've done the damage. They, they would, they've done the damage. And on to, and bumblebees as well. And is the common agricultural policy something to do with the badgers? No, that's Not our really. own decision. No. Isn't it? Yeah, no, that's that's right. that's our end decision. Emotion gets in the way. Drop of, down my of, last defence of Brexit, as if, <laughs> as if this was needed, please. <laughs> Don't worry about it too much. We can okay. it. Yes. This is a slightly abstract question. Quite right. Um, you were obviously raised in the family that you were raised to know what your future was going to be. So in a way, your life, to a certain extent, was mapped out with you know your duties and you know, inheriting um, the properties. If you hadn't had that kind of life, was there any dream of what you would have been instead? Any other careers or any other kind of um, life path that you would have chosen instead? I think it's a, it's a really good question because uh, one's so embedded in one's, one's upbringing, one's uh, inheritance and everything else. But sometimes when one gets deeply depressed about, about it for one reason or another, you think, well, if I didn't have this, one would be free. One would actually not have the shackles of that. But on the other hand, the shackles are a wonderful thing to have. So um, in a way, I've also set up companies, and that's that's what I've done to get away from what I call um, the mapping out of what, what was meant to be. And so I've set up companies and, and had a wonderful time doing that sort of thing, um, which, is, which wasn't in the rule book when I, when I was being brought up, in the same way that my father did the same. Um, but before that, my grandfather, my grandfather was born in 1855. So we did go back a, a long way. He fought in a red tunic for England. Um, with the Battle of al in, in in the Sudan. So it, my father was 50 years old than, than, than me. So um, they were very stuck to what they were doing with the First World War and the Second World War. And I've, I've been allowed to be much freer, I suppose you could say. But I think I might have been a, a barrister or, or something like that. And your sons feel much freer still? One of them feels, the eldest feels a responsibility to come back and fill your shoes? Well, I think they all, they, they all feel free. They, they all got, they've all got jobs. The important thing is they, they work jolly hard, and they, uh, and they have fun as a sort of secondary thing, but they work jolly hard. I loved your question. I was asked permission to ask a question about a blessing or a curse. I thought I was pushing it a bit too much, but that was just the but it is, right it, way of putting it. it. Is a, you know, to, to, to say that this is a curse, I think is the most appalling thing to say. It's a, it's a real blessing. Someone's got to stand up and say it's a real blessing. Please. This is not a plant, but I think your audience would be interested to hear about the, the earlier Sir Hickman Bacon, who was quite eccentric, I think, wasn't he? Well, my... My, <laughs> my, um, my grandfather... Um, was the second son, and his, his elder brother was Sir Hickman Bacon. And Hickey, as, as, as he was 
known as, was, was born in 1850. Um, and because in those days we all died of TB, um, my, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, didn't bother to find him a wife. So he never married. And, and he was a sickly child, so they thought he would just die like his brother at the age of 26. But he didn't. He died in 1945, age 90. And during that time, he, he was being a bachelor, and he was a very wealthy bachelor. He was able to indulge his fantasies from collecting wonderful English watercolors, um, 17th century, 16th century Turkish fabrics, um, Chinese porcelain. But at the same time, he designed a carburetor, which is still uh, the, the bare bones of it are in use today. He used to, he went around Brooklands at 100 miles an hour in 1900 in a car that I got into um, about a year ago, which I could, I, I, the idea of going 20 miles an hour would, would have been completely scary. Um, and he was fundamentally a Fabian. He was a, he was a great friend of the Webb family, who were uh, yeah, great sort of yeah. socialists in the, in the early part of the 20th century. Yeah. Well, they were fab Fabians, in effect. I was trying to um, put it in, in you know, the, the <laughs> translating of, of, of sort of um, Blairites of the, of the, yeah, exactly. <laughs> of, of the 1900s. Um, and he, he, he just was an extraordinary man. Um, but pr 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 predominantly, he was able to be extraordinary because he was, he was um, a bachelor. And, and they really minded about waste in those days. You know, for example, he, he was on the county council. He used to go to the county council in Lincoln um, by, by, by bus. And he would have um, his sandwiches in his, in his uh, bag. And any sandwiches that he hadn't eaten, he would eat at dinner that, that night. And he would always have a teaspoon of cod liver oil to keep him on the straight and narrow. But he lived in, there was obviously, no, there was no um, electricity, there was no running water, there was nothing like that. And so in a, in a very big house in Lincolnshire, um, James the butler used to, I'm, I'm told, used to bring up the hip bath, and the hip bath would be filled with water and in, his, in his bedroom, and that's where he used to bathe at night. So it was a very different world, um, and he died in 1945, he was 90. Thank you, David. One thing you said there that I just caught. Um, your parents, or his parents, didn't bother to find him a wife. No. You, you put that in a way as if arranged marriages were kind of the way things were. Do they still work like that a bit now? I hope not. Well, I, you know... They happened then. I, I, th there's no doubt that they happened then. And, and, and to some extent, I suppose, I can think of examples of where um, the mother has designs on who she would like her daughter or son to marry, which is a slightly different thing to arranging between yes. two families um, yeah. a marriage. But certainly in, that, in my grandfather's generation, two, uh, two sisters married two brothers of the same, of the same family. So yes, it was, it, I think it was... It was a bit right. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It didn't happen to me, I'd say, quickly. And I haven't have done, it, done it with my children either. One thing we haven't touched on is those three words, hunting, shooting, and fishing, which you kind of associate with posh, stroke, posh people, stroke, landowners. Um, do you regret the passing of hunting? Uh, would it come back? Is it can be confused with shooting and fishing, and you have you? Well, I think I, I think I, you I think might be a good shot. I'm guessing. I think that the debate on on hunting was was created for reasons which was nothing to do with the facts, but they were all to do with the emotion and the fact that um, Mrs. Blair, Mrs. Blair wanted, think, yeah. wanted yeah. Um, yeah. and it was it was a disastrous piece of legislation. But that's not 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 the point. It's happened, and it's and hunting has never been more popular. So I'm told, um, following up following up. Um, a drag, or whatever, it, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, but I come back to the question of what? Smelly sock. Smelly sock. Smelly sock. Red sock. Red sock. Red sock. Red sock. Red sock. But coming back, coming back to the conservation. That's where they go when they hunt and die. Coming back to the conservation thing, um, and I am passionate about the conservation. And we have two gamekeepers at home. Um, we don't 
rear any any pheasants or any partridges at all. We rely completely on on the wild um, production, as it were. And so the the spin-off of that is that we have what I consider to be a very vibrant natural um, world where we control species that are um, we regard as predators to the to the to the birds that we want to we want to increase, and the spin-off of that is that we get many other red book, book species um, which which tr thrive with us, but they don't thrive anywhere else. So I'm I'm a passionate believer that if we get rid of field sports, then the conservation movement um, is just going to die on its feet because we have. I think there are five or six thousand gamekeepers um, in in the UK, and if they disappear, then who is going to look after? Who's going to manage? And I, I think managing the countryside is absolutely vital because if you don't manage the countryside, it, 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 it it'll be the survival of the fittest, and the fittest of those which will predominate. And the essence, surely, of of the natural world is to make sure that you have all species being given a chance. Very well put. Yeah. Are you going to add? Please. Well, all I can say is that this year has been a complete and utter disaster. Um, we are unlikely to shoot hardly at all this year because we have no no wild pheasants, and and I don't know why. Um, 1976 was the same. We had no no wild pheasants. Um, the partridges, the grey partridges, which is the, the things that I care about, um, they've done okay, but we won't be shooting those because they there aren't enough um, as a stock. So the things that have done very well, the hares actually, the brown hares and the and the Chinese water deer, Chinese water deer. Chinese water deer. They're very good. The worst the, Chinese. The, 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 the um, seventy-five percent of the world's population of Chinese water deer, outside China, uh, are in the north. North coast. Yeah, true. Well, so there you are. What's yeah. your question? How big are they? Go on. What is happening to water deer? Water deer. It's an animal. Yeah. We four legs, and it's like a deer, and it's Chinese, and it's there's a lot of them. There's a very China, lot of, of them in Norfolk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was very scientific to apply, was it? Just, uh, yeah. And if, any, if, if anybody goes years. to to the Ledbury restaurant, you will you will be able to eat um, our own Chinese water deer and and hares. So you you an important part of your life is creating a sustainable environment yeah. for wildlife in Norfolk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That that's another thing I'm passionate about. Hey, you're very lucky to have these things. I know. Said. I mean, I'm you, incredibly You're lucky. talking to a metropolitan audience here, and you know, I was—I've never really heard anyone articulating these things like that. No, but I'm, just, I'm just passionate about it. But, I, I, but um, I, I just feel that there are extremes on both sides, and those extremes have got to come together because otherwise, we, we will be the general losers. We've just got a few more minutes left because we always finish on time. It's the New Zealand with the pink socks in the second row. It's coming back for another bite. Can I ask a practical question about Wisley Gardens? Was they come within your responsibility of our, our, of our HS? W Wisley Gardens? Yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah. Okay. My practical, practical question is that in the past two times I've been there, yes. you have particular parking attendants who've had a military background <laughs> yes. telling you to park in the far car parks, yes. even if you're going to buy plants at the shop, and each time we've just driven off. Yes. But it's something you may like to think about as to whether that practice is still going, because as a visitor, when the car parks are empty, they send you way up the road, and we just drive off. Um, but they have a particular military background, and maybe it's the way they do things. I'm surprised you take any notice of them, actually, but there we go. Well, um, I, well my wife tells me off if I ignore them. Right. But I think it's fair to say that Wisley is going through a mammoth um, investment program. We're spending £60 million at Wisley. And the new um, area where you will be able to go and pick up your plants um, will be a, a specialist area, so you can... Um, um, Whatever the expression is, pick, pick and not pick and mix, but, um, pick and pick. collect and pick. Yeah, so, or, or whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. 
you can do you can do all that, which is which I and I completely agree with you. And that's why our, our plant sales are not nearly as good as they should be. No, the part of the tenants are being really annoyed. Right, okay, well, I'll... I'll well, there we are. I, I never realised that we got quite some sort of tricky <laughs> questions and you were doing the marvellous politician's answer to deal with it's ferocious par <laughs> parking wardens at Bisley. Uh, Lucy. Lucy? Two questions. You had a doggy evening at Wisley the other day. Um, and as a dog lover, are you going to allow dogs to be able to come to Hyde Hall? To Hyde Hall. Hyde Hall is another garden um, of ours. The, 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 the straight answer is no. All right. And the um, second question, don't worry about answering that one. Is there a lot of gardeners in the Royal Parks um, who look after all the parks in London? And your prices for the Chelsea Flower Show are far too expensive for them. Could you allow a little Ooh. bit of ticketing to go to the gardeners who look after the Royal Parks in London? Well, the Royal Parks is one of the many institutions um, who look after gardens and so forth. Um, there, are, there are tickets available for those sort of people, and I think it's really vital that um, gardeners from proper gardeners, as it were, um, are allowed in for a hell of a lot less than what we charge um, most of the punters. Most of the punters. So yes, uh, I, I'll look into that, Lucy, actually. I'll find out what the form is on that. I think the thing to do would be to write to Lord Grossman, who's the new chairman of the new Royal Park set up, and say that there was a mass meeting at the I know, I know, which supported your view. There. I know Lord very, very well, so, so he can <laughs> write it, to me. He's your mass, he's right. <laughs> Um, yes, sorry. Yes. Let's just imagine being a top. Is he a top? No, he's not a top. East, East Coast top. He's he is. East yeah, Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, so a lot of your life you've, you've kind of been given these blessings and these incredible opportunities. Hmm. I'd like to know what, your, what you feel your um, personal achievements are that you've achieved from your, I don't know, from the core of your being, what drives you and what makes you tick and, and what have you achieved that you're really proud of? My grandmother would be appalled, wouldn't she, really? Um, I, I think achievement is about what other people think of you. Um, and if I'm, if I'm um, remembered as, as, as someone who was respected by their peers, then that would be good enough for me. And what makes me tick is, is various passions. You've heard one passion, which is sort of the conservation bit, the, the gardening bit, um, when I don't wear a tie. And I'm often, um, because we open our garden at home, um, people think I'm the gardener. So that is marvelous. And then they say, well, you're working on a Sunday. Well, that's, and I say, yes, they're dreadful employers. And so it goes on. You, know, you, can, you can imagine what, what, what happens. Um, but it's, it's, it's a passion. What makes me tick is a passion for gardening and, and, and actually doing, doing the, the, the Royal Horticultural Society and trying to help um, those people who, are, who need a lot of help um, and who have never experienced plants, trees, or greenness. And bringing them out into experience, that sort of thing, is really important. We've got one time for a 30 second question, a 30 second answer. Thank you. Actually, it's connected to the previous question in terms of are there one or two goals that you have wanted to achieve for yourself and you haven't? Well, I really wanted to be a really good businessman. Well, I'm hopeless at it, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but other than that, I'm, 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 I'm you know, reason, reasonably content. Your grandmother might not have approved this before, but uh, we certainly did. I, it was a, a lovely opening and honest and frank and funny and wonderful 60 minutes. Thank you very much. Nico, thank you.